Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to another video. My name is Dylan and I'm a cycling coach at CTS. And today we're gonna to be talking about what separates top level pro cyclists from the rest of us. I'll be touching on how much genetics plays a role, the physiology of elite riders, how much starting at an early age helps, differences in cadence. And finally, we'll see if there are any differences in how pro athletes think. The last one is of particular importance because most of what I'll talk about here is out of your control, but you can change your mindset to think more like a pro and hopefully improve your own performance. If you're new to this channel, I make weekly science-based training, racing, and gear-related videos. If you want to learn how to get faster or just more about the science of training in general, then be sure to subscribe. And if you have a training question or topic you'd like to see me cover in a future video, be sure to leave it down in the comment section below. I do my best to get to all the questions in the comments. Let's start the video off by talking about genetics, because obviously elite athletes have great genes. But how much of their performance can we contribute to having the right parents? First off, it's important to note that a massive individual difference exists in how people respond to training. This study on responses of aerobic power and capacity to training took 24 untrained subjects and put them all on the same 20-week cycling training program. What they found was that responses ranged dramatically between subjects from just 5% all the way up to an 88% increase in maximal aerobic power and 16 to 97% increase in maximal aerobic capacity. And these results are confirmed in multiple studies. This review on individual differences in response to physical activity found that changes in VO2 max after training range from almost no gain to a 100% increase in large groups of sedentary individuals. Clearly there's a large genetic component here and science has even been able to pinpoint the genes associated with response responders and non-responders. Training response is a bell curve with a very fortunate few experiencing an incredible physiological response to training. The vast majority of us sit close to the middle of the bell curve. The world's top cyclists on the other hand sit on the far right edge of the curve. For the same amount of work done, they get significantly stronger than the average person. Now let's get into some of the physiological differences that separate the best. Most people assume that the best endurance athletes have a higher VO2 max and that's why they're better. And while they do have extremely high VO2 maxes, they aren't necessarily much higher than say a top level amateur. This study on physiological factors associated with elite cycling performance took elite national cyclists and good state class cyclists and had them perform a simulated 40K time trial. The two groups did not differ in VO2 max or lean body weight. However, the elites were able to ride 10% faster and produce 11% more power. The two groups have the same VO2 max, so where are the elites getting this extra power? The difference came in how much of their VO2 max they were able to utilize. The elite group was able to ride at 90% of VO2 max, while the sub-elites could only manage 86% of their VO2 max. The factors that contribute to this difference? A greater percentage of type 1 muscle fibers in the elite, as well as a 23% greater muscle capillary density. Our lactate threshold sits at a certain percent of our VO2 max, and for elite athletes, that may be 90 plus percent of an already high VO2 max. This is more important than simply just having a high VO2 max. In this study on physiological factors determining endurance performance, they took two groups with identical VO2 maxes. However, one had a high lactate threshold at 82% of VO2 max, and the other had a low lactate threshold at 66% of VO2 max. In a performance test done at 80 to 80% 80 of VO2 max, unsurprisingly, the low LT group was only able to ride half the amount of time as the high LT group. Basically, your VO2 max sets your upper limit, but performance is more closely associated with at what percent of your VO2 max your lactate threshold sits. This is a good thing too, because after two or three years of intense training, your VO2 max won't change that much. If endurance sports were completely a VO2 max game, then you would reach your athletic potential fairly quickly and not see much improvement after that. The world's best endurance athletes do have high VO2 maxes, but what really sets them apart is their ability to utilize a high percentage of that VO2 max. So basically, pros have a high lactate threshold. Wow, Dylan, so enlightening. Really great insight there. There are some physiological differences that might explain this. For example, this study on differences of professional road cyclists found that pros have an important reliance on fat metabolism, even at high power outputs. Pros also exhibit certain neuromuscular adaptations, such as a high resistance to fatigue of slow motor unit fibers, and further research confirms these findings. Essentially, by using more fat as fuel, they don't have to tap into their stored carbohydrates as much, potentially leading to greater endurance. 
And on top of having an already higher proportion of type 1 or slow twitch muscle fibers, those type 1 fibers are even more fatigue resistant in pros. If you've ever wondered how a tour contender can ride at their FTP for 30 minutes up a climb at the end of a 5 hour stage 3 weeks into a grand tour, well there are some of the physiological reasons why. What about sprint performance though? This is something that's highly genetic, right? The chances of seeing a rider like Chris Froome win a field sprint at the world tour level are slim to none, and yet he's one of the best cyclists in the world. What are some of the physiological characteristics that the best sprinters need? This study looking at peak power outputs of elite cyclists took 35 elite cyclists, 18 sprinters, and 17 endurance cyclists, and assessed their muscles using an MRI. What they found was that 87% of the variability in peak power output comes down to two variables the volume of the quadriceps, and the actual angle of the muscle fibers. The smaller this angle, the greater force the fibers can exert because the fibers are pulling more parallel to the tendon. While it is true that anyone can work on and improve their sprint, these physiological differences, along with potential differences in fiber type, make it hard to become a great sprinter if you're not genetically gifted with these attributes. You know, Dylan, I think this is the first video of yours that I'm actually finding useful. I'm coming up with a whole bunch of new excuses to use on the group ride when I get dropped. Fortunately, not all of this may be entirely genetically predetermined. Going back to the study on physiological factors associated with elite performance, they observed a strong relationship between years of endurance training and the percent of type 1 muscle fibers, and they stated that it appears that elite national class cyclists have the ability to generate higher downstroke power, possibly as a result of muscular adaptations stimulated by more years of endurance training. This is also why starting at a young age is important if you want to become a top-level pro. This analysis of success in elite cycling found that those that compete at the junior elite level go on to be significantly more successful than those that don't. While there are examples of pros who didn't start racing until they were adults, the majority have been racing from a young age, and it makes sense too because by the time they hit the age where cycling performance peaks, they already have years of training in their legs. Now let's talk about cadence. It is true that on average, pros have a higher cadence than most of us, although even at the pro level, there are still grinders. Is having a high cadence something that separates the elite and something that we should strive for if we want to ride like them. In this article on determinants of optimal cadence, they stated that it should be noted that while optimal cadence may not differ between experienced and inexperienced cyclists at low power outputs, optimal cadence moves rightward with increasing power to a point where experienced cyclists may exhibit higher cadences simply because inexperienced cyclists are unable to operate. Basically, riding at a higher power causes pros to ride at a higher cadence not riding at a higher cadence cause them to put out more power. Generally, you'll find that as your power increases, so does your cadence. And since pros put out a lot of power, their cadence is generally higher. This does not mean that you should try to purposely ride at a higher cadence, though. This review article on optimal cadence stated that it would appear then that a single optimal cadence for all cyclists does not exist, or indeed a single optimal cadence for an individual cyclist. The cadence at which perceived exertion is minimized would seem to reflect the optimal trade-off between the most metabolically efficient cadence and the most mechanically efficient cadence. Whatever your freely chosen cadence is, is the cadence that you should ride at, and that goes for pros as well. While most of the world's best do ride at a higher cadence, this makes sense when we start to look at some of cycling's famous grinders. If you want to see me go into more detail and more science on cadence, I made a whole video about it and I'll leave it linked in the description below if you want to check it out. Lastly, let's touch on the mental side. Superior physiology will only get you so far. Pro cyclists have an incredible amount of dedication, willpower, mental toughness, and discipline to be able to complete the training day after day that's needed to be at that level. And when it comes to race day, it seems that certain mindsets are more successful than others. For example, in this review on mental toughness in sport, they found that research into the relationship between mental toughness and performance has consistently shown that better performances are associated with higher levels of mental toughness and that elite athletes have higher mental toughness than lower level performers. This systematic review on the psychology of elite cyclists found that elite cyclists have more positive mood profiles and are less susceptible to mental fatigue. Not only are the world's best extremely physiologically gifted, but it seems like they may be more psychologically gifted as well. This may be both helpful during the actual event and leading up to it when dealing with pre-race nerves. Going back to the review on elite cyclist psychology, they stated that pre-race anxiety impairs performance 
and pre-race confidence facilitates performance. One of my favorite quotes from Peter Sagan came during an interview when he was asked if he felt any pressure. His response? Why pressure? I think the riding on the bike is it's not the pressure, it's because I want to ride now. Working on your mental resilience is important for bike racing because racing requires being extremely uncomfortable for long periods of time. And on top of that, races rarely go perfectly, and having a no-quit attitude is what separates the best from the rest. Some examples include Chris Froome's monumental comeback at last year's Giro, Vanderpool's historic Amso gold race this year, or the countless number of times Nino Scherter has gotten a flat at a World Cup and still managed to take the win. It sounds cliche, but champions don't quit. A lot of what I've talked about in this video is out of your control, but this is something that we can all try to emulate. Difficult moments happen in training and racing, and cycling is a sport of who can endure the most pain. Successful pros don't let setbacks get to them and deal with pain extremely well. One thing that's helped me over the years is shifting how I felt about how successful the race was going, at least while I was actually racing the race. I used to very much tie success to the result. This meant if I was too far back, I would give up mentally because I wasn't going to get a result that day. I've shifted my mid-race goal to not being results-based, but being based on how much of myself I leave out on the course. My goal for every race is to give 100% all the way to the finish line, regardless of what position I'm in. The funny thing about not worrying about the result during the race is that my results actually started to get better. All right, let's do a quick recap. Responses to training vary wildly, from almost no gain to a 100% increase in fitness. Pros are on the far right side of the bell curve and respond extremely well to training. The elite have a higher VO2 max, there's no doubt about that, but what really separates them is how they're able to hold a higher percentage of this VO2 max for longer. A higher reliance on fat metabolism, a higher proportion of type 1 fibers, and more fatigue-resistant type 1 fibers could explain this. Factors determining sprint performance include quadricep volume and the angle of the muscle fibers in the quads. If you're not a natural sprinter, you can improve your sprinting performance, but you likely won't become a great sprinter no matter how much training you do. Pros do tend to ride at a higher cadence, but this is because as power goes up, cadence goes up as well, not the other way around. For pros and amateurs alike, your freely chosen cadence is best, and you shouldn't try to ride at an unnaturally high cadence. Pro cyclists exhibit superior mental toughness and more resistance to mental fatigue. Of all the things that I talked about in this video, this is definitely something that you can work on and improve. All right guys, we all know that I'm the real reason why everyone watches this channel. That other guy is just kind of the nerdy sideshow. So for this reason, I'm selling What Would Backwards Hat Dylan Do? t-shirts and stickers. Help fund my pro career because it turns out that not a lot of companies want to sponsor you based on how many Strava KOMs you have. Link down in the description. Thanks for watching, and if you like this video, be sure to give it a like, share it with a friend, and subscribe. And if you want to be notified every time I put out a video, be sure to hit the notification bell as well. If you're looking for a coach, if you sign up through CTS, be sure to use my code CTSDJ to save $40 by waiving the registration fee. Details are down in the description.